Hello, everyone. My name is Rose, and I am the Global Marketing Manager for Canful Power Systems, where we provide clean air solutions for turbo machinery. I am excited to welcome you all to this technical webinar on the topic of how to cut your carbon footprint. Before we start, I would like to share some communication tips. Right now, you are all on mute, but if you have any questions or comments during the presentation, please use the question pane in the GoToWebinar control panel. Throughout the presentation, we have an expert that will manage your questions. We will also have time for questions during the last 15 minutes. Finally, this webinar is being recorded and it will be shared once the presentation is complete. I will now introduce our next speaker, Andrew Besner from Gas Turbine World will share a brief intro on the expected market outlook for the GT industry based on their annual market forecast. Thank you, Rose, uh, for inviting us today and, and, and hello to everybody. Um, I'm Andrew Besner with uh, Gas Turbine World and I'm here to give a brief introduction looking at our market forecast and, uh, and where the market is going before handing off to the Camfield team. So renewable power generation is increasing, but the greener future over the next few decades will be led by gas, um, which will increase the demand on gas turbine operators to reduce their carbon footprint. Gas Turbine World's annual industrial turbine market forecast sees a projected demand for 30 to 35 gigawatts in new gas turbine additions per year over the next 10 years, with a continuing increase in the addition of smaller size renewable plants. This is supported by a recent EIA report, which expects electricity generation from renewable sources such as wind and solar to trail but not surpass gas fired generation until around 2045, possibly even further off with the advent of advanced clean burning hydrogen fuel gas turbines. Either way, gas turbine operators will continue to be incentivized by strict environmental regulations supported by more stringent emission targets and carbon taxes to become more efficient so as to burn less fuel and associated emissions per kilowatt produced. And today we're going to look at a cost-effective way power plants can operate more efficiently, efficiently using advanced inlet filtration to increase turbine efficiency and decrease emissions and save money on carbon taxes. So I'd like to introduce the Camfield speakers today. Um, first, going, we have Joshua Cohn, the R&D manager from Camfield Power Systems, and, uh, and Mark Van Den Eind, who's the vice president at Camfield Power Systems. And over to, uh, to Mark, who will take it from here. Thanks, Mark. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Andrew, for sharing gas turbines for market. For, for sharing gas turbines market forecast and emphasizing that the GT market will still be a major part of our energy mix for another couple of decades to go. But before going to the agenda, I very briefly want to introduce Canfield Power Systems. Canfield Power Systems are part of the Canfield Group, which is a global privately owned Swedish company founded in 1963. And our Canfield Power Systems division focuses on air inlet filtration systems for turbo machinery applications, where we strive to improve the air quality and the performance to power a cleaner tomorrow. And this by providing reliable and intelligent air solutions for maximum predictability and minimum complexity. And to do this, of course, we deal with the power generation industry, the oil and gas industry, by it on the upstream, the midstream, and the downstream side, as well as on the process industry, where also gas turbines and large industrial air compressors, compressors are critical assets where reliability and availability are key. During this webinar, I will introduce the drivers and the methods for reducing carbon footprint in this industry, after which Joshua will explain you more in detail how air and filters can reduce your CO2 impact. After that, 
we will brief you on the kind of filter characteristics that are really needed to give you the best results and show you how our online calculator can give you a rough idea how much CO2 you are actually currently emitting and thus how much you could save. And at the end, of course, when time permits it, we will have some Q&A session to answer the questions that you may have raised during this webinar. So first, let's look at the drivers and methods for reducing your carbon footprint. The drivers for cutting carbon footprint. Clearly, the number one driver is based on the constantly increasing awareness that actions need to be taken to reduce the impact from climate change. The pressure on the power gen and the oil and gas industry is rising quickly, and most companies are now diversifying even their portfolio to decrease their carbon footprint as a whole, to create a lower carbon intensity per barrel of oil equivalent, for example. But of course, as Andrew stated, gas turbines and the oil and gas industry will still be here for many years to come, and thus actions are needed on this side as well right now. Investors are more likely to invest in companies that can show a sustainable, greener future ahead. Secondly, the driver of policies, regulations pushed down from governments are clearly moving the bar year over year by implementing these taxes and regulations and making them more stringent. Sure, not all countries are at the same level right now. We see a big range of taxes, for example, on carbon emissions. It can go from zero dollars per ton up to 130 US dollars per ton. But those that believe that it will not go up in their countries, I think they're living a dream. Everywhere in the world, the knowledge and the awareness is rising and therefore taxes will increase on a global scale. So those that will not follow will probably not have a long life to live. But the third, and maybe definitely not the one that we should forget, it is also the right thing to do. If we want to have a globe tomorrow, we need to take actions right now so that there is still a globe for our children. When we look now at the different methods of cutting your carbon emissions, there are, of course, different opportunities available. When we look, for example, at carbon capture, it's a technology which is already known for many, many years. But why has it not been implemented yet in a widely spread market? Well, the major reason for it is that it is quite a big investment, a large capex investment on existing assets. And if investing in a new asset, it is a big add-on cost investment, which makes it less attractive for investors. Secondly, when we look at the alternatives of using fuels with lower carbon, we need to understand that currently natural gas is still the cleanest carbon fuel on the market. If you look at the table, the, the, the image below, you can see coal emitting 80 to 90 grams of CO2 compared to gas 50. So it's like almost half of what coal would emit. Therefore, natural gas has still a long life ahead of it. And of course, the market and the OEMs on the gas turbine side, they know that there is a, a clear message to have lower carbon fuel content. So there is a big investment going on also on that side from the OEMs to make their combustor, combustors capable of burning fuels with less carbon content, mixing natural gas, for example, with hydrogen, or even ending up on burning 100% hydrogen. However, these technologies are not there yet. They're under development and it will take still some years before it can be widely adapted. So what can we do now? If you look, you can burn your current fuel, of course, more efficiently. And one way of doing that is, of course, installing more efficient turbines or upgrading your existing turbines with upgrades on the compressor side or on the combustion side. But one other thing, is that you can also run your current turbines more efficiently at all times. And this you could do by probably looking at protecting the turbines from day one with the right filtration so that there is no degradation anymore. Before going any further, we have actually now a small poll that we would like to fill, 
ask you to fill out your view on this different topics of cutting your carbon footprint and which of those are you currently considering to be working at to reduce your carbon footprint would be nice if any everyone would enter their uh, main topics i think you can only select one so it's just to give a rough idea of what people are currently looking at to uh, reduce their carbon footprint we'll give you a few minutes to give us your option there Okay, so we clearly see here that a lot of people are actually already looking at increasing their efficiency on the air filters. So it seems that a lot of people in the audience here are aware that working on air filtration may have a bigger impact on your operations and therefore reducing your carbon emissions. We see also a little bit on carbon capture. I think the Lesser interest there clearly de demonstrates that it is a very expensive investment to do and also has some negative effects on the overall efficiency on your power plants, and that's why it's not so widely spread yet. Uh, changing your fuel type, I think a lot of OEMs probably have answered that because they're currently working on uh, developing their turbines to make them more suitable to burn also lesser carbon fuel. Uh, and the more efficient gas turbines, I think most OEMs in the audience here will, of course, uh, vouch for that. When we now go further, sorry. What do you believe has the lower cost? Modernizing your complete fleet of turbines or upgrading your filters. Well, I think we all can agree that modernizing your fleet of turbines is quite a big investment for most of us. And whereas upgrading the filters within the existing housings is a very minor investment, but it still will have the impact that you seek. It will actually have the effect that you will have less fouling and corrosion on your gas turbine, whereby you do, therefore have a more fuel efficient engine running. And of course, on the other side, you also need to look at the filter performance where you can create a low and stable pressure drop so you can run for a prolonged period of time with that same filter solution because you don't want to be, need to stop the engine frequently for filter changes either. So both of these aspects of a better filtration means that you will be able to burn less fuel, less CO2 emitted per megawatt hour produced. And now I will hand over to Joshua, who will give you the explanation how air inlet filtration actually can help you to reduce your CO2 impact. Hmm. Take it away, Joshua. Hey, thank you, Mark. So I'll spend a few minutes now talking about why air filters could help with CO2 emissions. So let's go on for a few slides here. I'll try and take control of the screen. Okay, so if we step back, why do gas turbines release carbon dioxide? And then let's see what we could do to reduce that amount. Now, whenever your fuel is burnt, whether you're burning natural gas, methane, mainly methane or some other fuel type, you're reacting that fuel with oxygen and you're producing a little bit of carbon monoxide, but you're mainly converting that fuel into carbon dioxide. So anything that you could do to reduce the amount of fuel that has to be consumed to make your power will reduce equivalently the amount of carbon dioxide that's produced. And I think it's interesting that it's not a one-to-one -one ratio either. If you look at the equation I have here, where you're turning CH4 into CO2, 
uh, every one kilogram of methane that you burn is going to be turned into almost three kilograms of carbon dioxide. So that means that there's a force multiplier here where any small savings in the amount of fuel that you burn, the amount of met methane that you uh, consume will have triple that effect on your, the amount of kilograms, the amounts of tons of carbon dioxide that you're emitting. Uh, so as Mark was saying, there's one thing that you could do to reduce the amounts of carbon dioxide that you produce. You could use fuels that have less carbon um, in them and uh, release less carbon dioxide that way. But another way is just straight up using that fuel more effectively, reducing the amount of CH4 of natural gas or of any other fuel being burnt, and that will directly lead to less carbon dioxide being emitted. So now that we have that, let's see how air filters could actually have an impact on the amount of, uh, of fuel that would be consumed. So we'll go to the next slide here. And Could you change uh, slides, Mark, please? Thank you. Um, so when it comes to air filters, what is their impact on this equation of how efficiently turbines will consume fuel? Well, their impact there is all about protecting turbines from dirt in the air, getting into the engines, fouling them, um, and causing a nice heavy buildup of particles on all the turbine blades. You could see a little image of turbine fouling on the right, all of the, the different white uh, buildups on the turbine blades. So anything that will get into the turbine from the outside air and coating these blades is going to reduce the efficiency of that turbine. Um, so, the goal of air filters is really to stop this from happening. You want to prevent all of the particles from outside air from ever getting into the engine in the first place so that you could stop this issue of fouling of the engines running less efficiently over time. And when I say an engine would be running less efficiently if it has its blade coat, its blades coated with, with dirt, if it's all clogged up with, with, with different dirt particles, um, well, that means the engines will be producing less power outputs and also that their heat rates will be going up. So we all know that less power output is, is bad for the amount of, of energy uh, produced, but let's look at the heat rate side as well. So we'll go to the next slide. Uh, what is heat rate? Well, heat rate is defined as the amount of fuel you have to burn uh, to produce a unit of power how many kilojoules of fuel you have to produce to make one kilowatt hour of the electricity. So if uh, your air filters are letting dirt into the engine and the engine is then running less efficiently with a 1% higher heat rate, that means that you'll be burning 1% more fuel for every megawatt hour that you produce. That also means, as we saw on the last slide, that not only are you burning 1% more fuel, but you're also producing 1% more CO2. So that's really where air filters come into play. Our goal here is to keep the engines running efficiently at their design heat rate, uh, so that you don't have these degradations in performance leading to more fuel than expected burnt and more CO2 than expected released. But these are all very theoretical numbers. Let's go to the next slide where we'll look at some examples of what the average site could actually see in terms of how much of an impact do air filters really have on carbon dioxide emissions. So we'll go down to the next slide. Um, so if we look at different filters that could be used, oh, go back one, side, one slide, please. Um, we'll just go back to the slide showing the actual effects of filters. Um, are you able to uh, to change back, Mark, for a second, or would you like me to uh, to share my screen? Uh, 
Uh, okay. I'll just keep going from here. So. Josh, you are the presenter now. Uh, thank you. You're welcome. Here we go. So if we're looking at our air filters, um, air filters are rated per a few different air filter standards. I'll talk about two of them here, EN779, EN1822. Uh, the filters are rated on a scale from 1 to 17, where the higher the number, the higher the efficiency. Now, a very common filter that we see a lot of turbines have been provided with in the last several years is something around that FH filter class. That's been pretty much a standard for uh, for a lot of new built turbines for several years. We're seeing the market is slowly moving up to higher efficiency. Uh, E10, E11, E12, uh, EPA, HEPA turb uh, filters. Um, but there's a considerable amount of turbines today uh, running F8 filters. So let's look at what sort of power impact you could expect due to fouling. Um, uh, in that case. So you could expect with an F8 filter to have your turbine produce a, almost 5% less power uh, than it's rated at over the year, and also have the heat rate be two, almost 2.5% two higher. If you would upgrade your air filters from an F8 to an E11 class, well then instead of having almost 5% less power output per year, you'd have only about 1% less power output per year and going from two and a half uh, excess fuel to half a percent excess fuel. So really the improvement in this case from upgrading your filters from a, a in an F8, very, very common uh, rated filter to an EPA, HEPA E11 filter would mean a 4% uh, uh, improvements in the power output or the power capacity of that engine and about a 2% yearly savings in your heat rate or in the amount of fuel that's consumed. Uh, now, of course, if you're starting off from a lower rated filter, uh, we see a lot of filters that are installed on uh, on offshore sites that are going for more high higher velocity filters in the M6 F7 class, um, and we we see there power output losses per year of almost 10% or heat rate changes heat rate increases of of five or six percent per year. So the amount of CO2 savings, while it could be 2% on the average land-based gas turbine, when you're looking at more offshore oil and gas um, gas turbines, your savings could go up from 2% to 5% savings quite easily when you, uh, when you look at the amount of fouling that these engines would have. So let's, uh, let's look at what that means in CO2. So if you do this upgrade, going from a, a standard F8 filter that a lot of, of turbines have been supplied with and running with for years up to an E11 filter. You, let's say that you get that uh, average 4% increase in your power capacity and you have a 2% lower heat rate. What does that mean for your turbines? If your turbine's running at full load, you're making as much power as you possibly can make. Well, your extra power capacity is great. You're going to be producing 4% more power and your heat rate is going to be going down by 2%. Because your heat rate goes down by 2%, that means that your fuel consumed will also go down by that same 2% per megawatt hour produced and your CO2 released will go down by that same 2% per megawatt hour produced. What if you're at part load? If your engine is able to make 45 megawatts, but you're only making 40 megawatts to drive some process, well, in that case, your the extra power capacity isn't helpful. You weren't running at full capacity anyways, so there's no change in the power output of the engine, but your heat rates will still go down by 2% by doing this upgrade. Your engine will still be running more efficiently by 2%, burning 2% less fuel per megawatt hour produced, and your CO2 released will also go down by 2%. 
per megawatt hour produced. This is the case uh, for for a lot of uh, of, uh, of oil and gas or of offshore turbines that might not be running at full capacity all the time. Um, but even there, even if the upgrade in air filters has no change on the amount of power pr produced, it'll still have a very big change on the heat rate of that engine, on the fuel consumption, and on the CO2 released. Uh, so let's look back at a bigger picture here. So we've seen how the amount of fuel burnt is, a, is directly proportional to the amount of CO2 released. We've seen that air filters could reduce the amount of CO2 released by making the engines run more efficiently. And we've seen what are some typical numbers on, uh, on CO2 emission improvements, somewhere around the 2% for a, a, a land-based turbine with an F8 filter, somewhere around the 4 to 5% CO2 emission savings if you're looking at more offshore high-velocity M6 filters. Um, let's bring that back to, uh, to a more uh, global scale. If we look at the US uh, in 2019, natural gas power plants were a pretty important part of the electrical grid. Um, natural gas power plants in the US in 2019 produced about 1.6 million megawatt hours of electricity. And we saw uh, Andrew talking about how that will go up um, for, the, for the next couple of years. So out of that 1.6 million megawatt hours, uh, there was over 600 million metric tons of CO2 that were released only in the USA. And if we have the capacity to save 2% of that, well, 2% sounds like a small number, but 2% of that over 600 million tons of CO2 outputs, that's a saving of about 12 million metric tons of CO2 per year, only for the USA. Uh, so you get into some pretty enormous potential savings here <clears throat> if we could go and upgrade uh, the air filters that have been used for many, many years now uh, on a lot of, uh, of engines up to newer, higher efficiency turbines. There's a huge potential savings here. Um, that's on a very large scale. If we bring that back down to, to what could you do at your site to save CO2? Well, a 2% saving in heat rate, a 2% saving in the CO2 released, that's equivalent to saving seven tons of CO2 per megawatt hour produced. So if you look at how many megawatt hours your site is producing, is consuming, um, then a 2% savings means that you could save seven tons of CO2 and you could really make a, a pretty big difference uh, on a site by site level. And that turns into an enormous savings uh, on, on a more global scale. So I hope that makes sense here, uh, wh where we've taken uh, from CO2 release from fuel all the way down to what you could do to save that. Um, I had a lot of examples here looking at potential power capacity savings somewhere in uh, where I was suggesting somewhere around the uh, four to five percent power capacity saving for an F8 filter, one percent for an E11. I'd like to bring the question to you and ask you all, uh, when you do a, a turbine water wash, uh, how much power recovery do you see? Um, so we'll give you, a, give you guys a minute or two to look at that. I have a question on the screen here. So how much power recovery do you see whenever you do an offline water wash? Uh, an offline wash going and, and uh, washing out the engine, removing all of that dirt, all of the oily films, reducing, uh, removing all of the, the, the particle buildup uh, on the turbine blades that's causing this drop in efficiency, in turbine efficiency. Uh, okay, and now if we look at the results of that, so it looks like um, a lot of sites are in that one to two percent um, power recovery seen per wash. 
some in that three to five percent, a few have went up to very high-end filters or are operating in cleaner sites and are in that zero to one percent power recovery per offline wash. So this is all very good to see. Um, and the amount of power recovery is really also related to the how often you're doing these water washes. So we have one more question to ask you on how often you're doing you, these offline water washes. How many times per year that's done? Uh, okay, so I'm seeing a lot of people are in that one to two times per year doing water washes. Uh, we see a lot of sites are trying to do water washes one time per year um, and schedule that at the same time as their scheduled uh, yearly maintenance. Um, seeing a bit more sites are doing two water washes per year. That's also very typical, very interesting results here. So now, thank you all for, for your attention. I will pass the screen back to Mark and he will uh, continue going on about uh, what are the filter characteristics, characteristics that could help save CO2 emissions. So let me transfer the screen back to Mark. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Joshua. So now we get to the point where we need to talk a little bit about the filter characteristics that you need to reduce your CO2 on your turbines. And there are actually three main filter features which are critical to make sure that you protect your gas turbine with the right filtration. Uh, one of it is actually you need to pass from the typical F-class filtration solutions to EPA-grade efficiency. And the main reason for that is that when you install an EPA-grade efficiency, you know from the very first hour you start running your operating your turbine that it will be protected with the efficiency that is described by the filter product itself. With F-class filtration, that is not the case uh, because they're talking about the average efficiencies, which do not really correlate with the real life experience that you will have with a filter. Whereas with an EPA grade efficiency, whatever you have as the curve of efficiency, that's where that filter will start from. It is not a destructive test when they test those filters, with as a result that this is the initial efficiency of that filter and will protect your turbine from the very first hour in that way. The second feature, which is very important also, is the hydrophobic properties of your filter elements. Uh, that will be two, two types of aspects that need to be looked at. It's the construction of the filter itself and the media that has been used. Uh, first of all, the hydrophobic is probability of the media should help you to prevent that any water droplets can get through the media and get to the clean air side. Because any water that can get through the media eventually will have taken some of the contaminants with it and these will end up anyhow again on your compressor in your turbine section. So therefore again allowing the degradation due to fouling to happen. Furthermore with the hydrophobic properties it's very important to know that of course the salts are very uh, easy to dissolve in water and of course if your filters are not able to retain that water and discard that water on the dirty air side you will have the risk that those salts migrate through the media and get into your gas turbine section where they do not only provide corrosion, cold corrosion on the compressor side, but it will also create a high risk of hot corrosion on your hot section, on the turbine section. So these are two very important uh, criteria to prevent your engine from seeing all these fouling aspects and corrosion aspects. And then the third characteristics, which is more an operational uh, characteristics, which will help you to create a more reliable and more available operation, is also having a filter that can give you a very low and stable pressure drop at all times under all weather and environmental conditions. 
because by giving you this low and stable pressure drop, you will be able to assure that you emit the lowest CO2 emissions possible at all times in a reliable way and don't risk any uh, outages on your gas turbine. So when we look at those three features and you have the filter solution and the filter system set up, design also the housing set up to take care of all this, avoid also any bypass on the filters, which is also important to know. It's not only the filters, it's also the filter system design is important on that aspect. Have additional impact on your operations. Besides the CO2 emission reduction that you can realize, there is of course some additional operational advantages and benefits that you will see. You will increase your availability due to the fact that you will not have to stop your engine anymore for doing water washes because you will not, you will not see this degradation and these power output losses or this heat rate increase on your gas turbines anymore. If you have invested in the right filtration solution, combined filter stages, combination of filter stages, you will be able to actually reduce the number of filter changes needed. You will be able to match them with your normal outage plan, outage schedules, so you don't have any unwanted outages anymore. Again, increasing your availability. And by protecting, of course, your gas turbine with the right filter solution, the right EPA grade efficiency, uh, with the right hydrophobic properties, you will also extend the component life of your gas turbines itself. Uh, increasing reliability, what do we mean by that? Well, it just means that because we will see less degradation on your turbine, of course, you will have a more reliable operation overall. You will have a lower risk of a turbine trip. If you have a filter that actually has a risk of having a high pressure drop spike during operation, this can still create a turbine trip. So that's why also the feature of a low and stable pressure drop under all conditions is very critical when searching for the right filter solutions. And of course, when you have a filter house that protects your gas turbine in an adequate way, and you see that there is less degradation on your turbine, you will also be able to predict more accurately what your output is going to be. And therefore you can also sell more energy to the grid where needed, and you can meet those output demands at all times. All these two facts, the increased availability, as well as the increased reliability will of course result in an overall greater profitability for you as a company because you will have a higher uh, output potential so you will have a higher income revenue stream generated as a result of it but on the same time you will be able to do that with a lower opex so low operational expenses related to it and of course as suggested already in the previous slide when you have the right fill the features, you will be able to reduce your CO2 emissions to a maximum and therefore reduce your taxes, which are actually on your bottom line of your results. And in order to support this, we have also created an online calculator on our web tool on our website, which you can reach on our www.boostreduce.com uh, link or you can also click on the links provided in our messages on social media. So you can directly go to that landing page on our website. Briefly, I want to show how this works. On this web landing page, you will find some general uh, comments on why this is uh, beneficial for you. And then we have also created these two uh, buttons there that you can see to calculate your savings, potential savings. One is actually just going to calculate the emissions of CO2 that you can reduce, basically comparing with your current system and what indicatively you could reduce your emissions with. And then the CO2 tax calculator is actually more a financial way of presenting this to you. Before going to the calculator, when you push one of these calculator buttons, we request you to submit the form that you can see here on the screen where we just want to know your name, your company name, your email address, and your country where you're located, just for our own lead generation, a little bit to understand who is actually using our calculators and what their uh, targets are. Then when you click on the CO2 emissions calculator, it is actually quite simple to use. There's only four information points that you need to enter. You need to enter the average power demand of your power plant of your asset that you're running with. 
the operating hours that you're normally using on a yearly basis for that turbine. Then you need to enter the heat rate, whether it's a combined side open cycle, so you can put your exact value in there. If you don't know it, you can put just an average value in there. What, the, what we've seen here on the screen right now is like a, a combined cycle heat rate, very good one. And then the current final filter class, where the different filter classes that you can opt from are rated based on either the ISO EN779 or EN1822. Uh, filter classification or the MRF classification according ash rate. And in the example, as you see, when you fill, when you fill out on the left side this form and you submit the form, then you get the results which you can see on the right side. And the results will show you in this specific case that with an F8 filter solution as a final filter stage on a power plant that is generating on average 2000 megawatts uh, per hour and operating 8000 hours a year, Due to the F8 filter solution that would be installed on that specific site, you would actually emit an additional 88,000 tons of CO2, mainly due to fouling of your compressor on your gas turbine, thereby degrading the performance of your turbine, increasing the heat rate, and therefore increasing your fuel consumption, and therefore also your emissions. And if you would actually upgrade that solution to the most optimal solution, you would be able to reduce your emissions by approximately 78,000 tons while producing the same output over that full year. A little bit in the same way, we have uh, created the CO2 tax calculator and the first four uh, informations that are needed here are the same as on the CO2 emissions calculator. And in addition to that, we ask you actually to let us know what is your relevant production unit. In principle, you just need to figure out uh, are you a power generation unit, so you're interested more in megawatt hours that you can put on the grid, are you an oil producing company, so you want to know how much barrel of oil equivalents I'm actually producing. Then the, the pricing below is, of course, these are all confidential information and it's not uh, tracked or traced, so we be sure that it's not traced by us. It's just for your own information to give you some indicative values. So you enter a value per price per megawatt hour, price per barrel of oil equivalent, for example. Then you enter the CO2 tax rate uh, that is valid for your assessment or of your uh, investment that you want to do. And then the net margin, which is normally the industry net profit margin that we consider here as a value. And there's also that will differ from a power generation unit to an oil gas company. So differing from industry to industry. As I said, these are information that you can give use for yourself. And the reason why we ask these financial information is because if you then go to the result page, we show, of course, how much bottom line result this would give you. So in this specific case here, where we have used the F8 filter, we actually were able to save $1.5 million per year bottom line. And if you then convert that back to how much power output should I produce to generate the same uh, bottom line result of $1.5 million, I should actually generate an additional 560,000 megawatt hours extra in that same fiscal year with that power plant. So just to give you a little bit of a good view on what that means for your asset itself. Now, this, this calculator is just to give you a rough indicative value. When we look actually to your actual operations, of course, was shown in the presentation also from Joshua, environment also plays a role in the type of filter solution that you would need. And in order to give you more in-depth studies, we are able to give you another tool. It's a proprietary tool from Canfield called LCC Power that allows us to really compare different filter solutions and really dig deep in the whole cost efficiency, both on CapEx and OPEX side, including the impact of filtration on your uh, filter costs, your indirect filter costs due to output loss due to pressure drop, and the falling and thermal corrosion costs related water washing, and of course, the CO2 emissions per megawatt hour produced. We are confident that with our boost reduce campaign, we can, with upgrading GT filtration slash CO2 emissions on a global scale, we have developed specific products for this boost to reduce campaign to make very clear to the audience that we have products dedicated to reduce CO2 emissions and allow you to be able, in a very cost-effective way, reach your goals and targets 
by reducing your carbon footprint. For the static filter systems, we have our CAN-GT series, which is actually already for more than 20 years known in our industry as a clear and proven uh, record on global references worldwide with operations of more than 20,000 to 30,000 operating hours for one single filter. And then also on the pulse side, we have also developed different medias that can allow us to offer to get the right features, EPA efficiency, hydrophobic properties, and also a low and stable pressure drop under all environmental conditions. And then at the end, just to show an additional service that we can offer for those that are really interested to understand their specific environment and how they can best tackle uh, their environment with the right filter solution. We also have what we call CAM labs. These are actually either trailers or 40, 20 foot containers that we can put on your site where we can simulate with different comparisons of different filter combinations. And those filters will run at exactly the same conditions as your current GT air intake filters would be running on your turbine. So you can compare the results in the actual environment and how they would perform. This is more or less everything that we had to show during this webinar. And I think we can now go then to the questions uh, and see if there is any questions to raise and uh, then we can answer them now. Thank you very much. Any specific questions uh, that have been raised? I right, got your one question. I got your one question. Uh, does the use of cleaner fuels impact the sale of air filters? Well, in general, the use of cleaner fuels will not impact the sale of our air filters. Uh, as you will understand, uh, in the beginning of our presentation, we made it very clear that the aspect where filtration plays a big role is running your turbines as efficiently as possible and thereby using whatever fuel you're using as efficiently as possible. So therefore, by protecting the gas turbine to run at this uh, more or less test cell performance at all conditions as long as possible uh, will mean that whether you use a cleaner fuel or not will not have an impact on sale of air filters for us. Do we need to upgrade complete filter housing or only filter elements? Uh, well, that depends a little bit on your uh, actual system design. If the system design from origin was not designed to have EPA filters installed, it may actually be, of course, necessary to make a modification to your existing housing to make it suitable to fit EPA filters. Because, of course, if you fit an EPA filter, but you have a lot of bypass, through the filter sections or through the filter design or the system design itself, you may never reach really the EPA grade efficiency that you're looking for. So I think that needs to be looked at from case to case. And uh, we have people all over the world that can do site surveys to assess your current systems and make sure that we provide you with the right answer on that on the question. I hope that answered your question. Joshua, did you have any questions? Uh... I Yes, I had a few questions here. Um, one question said, could you tell about the filter's capacity to retain salt at offshore environment operation? So when it comes to filter handling salt, um, there's the, the key things there is you want the filter to be fully um, salt is either in the air as a solid or as a liquid. If it's in the air as a solid, then you want a high efficiency filter to catch it. If it's there as a liquid, you want a very uh, hydrophobic, very water resistant filter that will stop it with very efficient drainage. That could then take all of this, this salt water and drain that away so that the salt doesn't stay onto the filter elements. Uh, you wanna make sure the filters aren't challenged by that salt uh, over the long term. Um, and you uh, and for the the small amounts of salt that do remain on the filter, you definitely want a very hydrophobic filter that could stop that from penetrating through. We see a lot on the uh, on the market when filters aren't quite as hydrophobic as they should be. Uh, a big problem is 
any dry salt crystals that remain on the filters. Uh, they're all happy caught on the filter it, until uh, the next time that it rains, the next time that it gets humid, those salt crystals get wet again, and you've now generated salt water right on the filters that could could uh, then leach through the filters onto the downstream side. So it, it's it's really critical to have the not just the right uh, particle efficiency, but the right hydrophobicity, the right water resistance, and the right drainage. Um, and if you have that, then we've had a lot of success on stopping salt ingestion in salty environments. Um, had another question, uh, are these solutions equally effective for Arctic as well as desert environments? Um, there are great filter solutions for both Arctic and desert environments. Here we was we're talking at a very high end uh, about the benefits of uh, increasing filter efficiency in terms of keeping the engines running as they should be. Um, <clears throat> you could use high efficiency uh, filters in all different environments. We'd be happy to talk to you about uh, how to select the right filters uh, for your, your particular site and come to, uh, to some, some good uh, suggestions there. So please get in touch uh, with us. Um, Sophie, do, do you have any other questions you'd like to direct to either Andrew, Mark or I? Uh, there was one question for Andrew about the impact of COVID on the uh, the future of gas turbine and the sales of gas turbine. Yeah, um, th thanks, Sophie. Um, um, so, so yes, so we we do see different impacts for for different segments um, in electric utility versus oil and gas. Um, in in EPU, um, the loss is still, the, there will be a loss, and it's directly attributed to the ad adverse impact of COVID nineteen on on global GDP and planned investment in large energy projects, primarily LNG and electric utility programs. Um, for EPU, we expect um, um, projected gas turbine orders to decline by as much as fifty percent during twenty twenty compared to previous estimates and uh, recover to more normal demand by the end of next year, 2021. So rebounding to growth in about two years. Um, for oil and gas, um, we expect orders, uh, orders are expected to fall by 70% over the next three years compared to previous forecasts and return to routine forecast levels by the end of 2022. So rebounding to growth in about three years. Um, on our website, if you're on our homepage, um, there is a there is a write up about this um, with full details on uh, on these two segments, and and you can read about it there. So, um, any other questions, uh, you could also direct to me. Okay. Any more questions? There's uh, quite a few questions about um, the impact of upgrading filtration uh, on either the footprints. So does it require yeah. uh, an air inlet change or is it only a filter change? And if it's only filter change, uh, what are consideration uh, people should have in terms of pressure drop and life for the air filters? Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, in general, uh, on that level, I think it's, uh, very important to understand that, for example, uh, high velocity filtrations on offshore platforms mostly have been designed based on uh, space constraints. Uh, and, and of course, uh, these space constraints will drive a little bit the decision on what, what to do. Uh, if there is a little bit more space, most likely the more cost effective long term solution would be to upgrade the filter house to slightly bigger housing where, where possible. But nevertheless, we have already run uh, different upgrades on high-velocity systems to upgrade filtration solutions within the same space constraints on those sites. Uh, in some cases, we just need to do a minor modification to the existing housing. In some cases, we replace the existing housing by new housing. All depends a little bit on the state of the current housing itself also, uh, how, how far has it corroded, uh, what's the state of the housing. Uh, I said in the previous uh, remark already, when you need to up upgrade to an epigrade solution and you have a system that has not been designed for epigrades, most likely you need to do a modification to the housing at least to make sure that wherever the final filter is installed, that that is suitable for fitting an epigrade filtration and, uh, and avoiding any risk of bypass uh, over the filter wall construction or the design of the system. 
also the flange construction and stuff like that probably will need to be checked up on so there is no bypass on the cleaner side either so um, I think that's a more generic uh, answer to that uh, but as I said we, we can do site service we can visit the sites to assess all these things and uh, come back with our recommendations Um, I have a couple more questions here. Um, so there's one question about uh, what is the general filter life? Um, that's really up to you to, to pick what you would like to have on your final filter life. Um, when we're looking at filters, uh, the goal is always that uh, to protect whatever is behind it. So uh, here I've been talking about picking the right final filter efficiency to protect your gas turbine. Um, then you could also pick the efficiency of your pre-filter to, to give the right protection onto your final filter. Uh, so if you would like uh, to, to get a one-year life on your final filter, then we could design a system for that. In other applications, we have people that want to get um, multi-year, several years life on their, their final filters to match uh, different uh, maintenance cycles. So we could always uh, help tweak what filter lives you're looking for, depending on what different products uh, we could use there. So please get in touch with us. Uh, another question here, um, question is why when you upgrade from an F8 to an E11 at part load, is there no improvement in power output? Um, and also, do you offer HEPA filters in uh, conical cylinder shapes? So yeah, uh, the easier question, I'll, I'll get out of the way first. Uh, we do offer HEPA efficiency filters um, in conical cylinder shapes as well as in square shapes. Um, if you look at why does the upgrade from an F8 to 11 at part load not improve power output? Well, it's because if you're at part load, uh, you're not running at full engine capacity. Upgrading your filters will make your engine run more efficiently and it will increase your capacity to make power. Uh, but if you're not running at max capacity because your process that you're running doesn't need every single megawatt that your turbine could produce, well then uh, you're not gonna get any benefit on the power output side. However, you will still get the benefit on the heat rate improvements um, so you will still get the benefits on the amount of fuel consumed um, as well as on the amounts of CO2 produced by that engine. Okay, I hope that answers that. Um, I... Any other questions here? Um, I'm answering here to a question which was raised that, uh, okay, sometimes uh, people say, okay, we have some, we were able to stretch the life of a, an E11 filter up to three, three years or four years. Um, I think in general, as Joshua already said, I think everything is possible, uh, but it will be directly related to the environmental conditions at hand in your operation, operational mode. So whether you run base load, peak load, standby mode, uh, this will all have an impact, of course. And of course, the environmental conditions will have a major impact as well. If you are a very clean environment, it will probably is no risk whatsoever to run a, tur a turbine and, and guarantee a long service life. Um, but if you have a very dirty environment, okay, you may need to do a different uh, approach and you need to maybe have more filter stages to protect that final filter stage that you want to have as long as possible installed in your system. So, uh, we can help you there by doing a full environmental assessment, uh, tracking, uh, looking at the history of the environment on your site, uh, trying to gather more intelligence about the environment, what kind of contaminants you have. We have labs in different uh, regions of the world where we can uh, do air analysis, air audits. We can test the contaminants that are captured in existing filters. Uh, we can also do some analysis on, on the water washing liquids to assess what actually has gotten into the turbine. So there is a lot of services that we can offer in addition to this uh, to better understand your environmental conditions. And based on that knowledge and that expertise, we can then for sure always develop a solution that will fulfill all your requirements that you have set as targets. Uh, everything, of course, has a price tag to it. So, of course, uh, it will be a balancing act and, and trying to find the right compromise to deliver the right solution that delivers, uh, fulfills your targets, your requirements, 
and is also uh, competitive on a cost side. Um, thank you there. I have a couple other questions. I see you don't have a lot of time left and there's a lot of questions here. I'll try and go through some. Um, one question, um, someone pointed out that we haven't spoken a lot about initial DP and filter area. Um, yeah, um, so when I'm when I was talking about CO2 emissions, I was mainly talking about filter efficiency. Uh, you, the, that is a very good point that high filter pressure drop, um, high initial pressure drop will also reduce the efficiency of the engine um, and increase the heat rates, increase the amount of CO2 released. Uh, but it's to a much, much smaller degree than the filter efficiency. Um, the filter pressure drop does have have a pretty uh, big impact on power output, um, but it has a much smaller impact on the the uh, heat rate change. So when we're looking at the at here at just the the change in heat rate, the change in fuel and CO2 emissions, really the main driver there is going to be your uh, your filter efficiency. Um, had some uh, some questions about uh, correlations between filter efficiency and the expected power outputs. Uh, we do have some data like that. Um, we have a, a life cycle cost tool uh, where um, you could put in your cleanliness level of the sites, the filter efficient, uh, the um, the filter efficiencies you're using. Um, uh, the engine that you have, and we'll uh, we'll use that to predict uh, the amount of uh, of power loss that you would see at your site. So instead of using these very general numbers um, that we are looking at for uh, for global turbines, if you'd like to get some more precise uh, numbers for your actual site, then I'd be very happy to look over the uh, the life cycle cost tool and give some some better estimates. I think that's the the best way of doing that. Um, had some questions about what if we uh, we increase the amount of hydrogen, reduce the amount of methane uh, in the fuel. Um, yeah, so anything that that will reduce the amount of carbon that you're burning will reduce mm -hmm. the amount of carbon dioxide that you're uh, you're you're producing uh, as well. So yeah, we don't really have any impact on that on the air filter side. So didn't talk about that one. Um, we're more looking at what you could do given the same fuel, but you are right that by going to uh, lower carbon fuels, moving from coals to oils to natural gases, um, you uh, and then and then adding in more hydrogen, you, you will be producing less CO2. Um, Rose, how are we doing on time? Or Mark, do you have any other questions there? Uh, we okay. So yeah, the the time is up. We're at ten o'clock now. But uh, we'll go through the questions after the webinar and respond to the ones that we didn't cover. Um, we'll try to do that right after. So uh, expect maybe a couple days at the most. Um, is that okay with you guys? All right. So um, that concludes the webinar. But if you do have any other questions, feel free to reach out to any of us here. Um, I would like to thank Andrew for your partnership and sharing this important message. And thank you everyone here today for joining us. Stay tuned for news on upcoming webinars. They will be announced on our Campbell Power Systems LinkedIn page. Uh, finally, your feedback is really important to us. So we have a short satisfaction survey that will appear after the webinar is complete to help us improve. So thank you again, everyone, for your time and attention. And I hope you all have a great day or a great evening. Thank you.